text is found in Mark chapter 8, and we're only going to read 31 through 35. Say amen when you have it. If you're a guest of mine and you don't have your electronic device with you or your Bible, your leather King James Version, okay? It says in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 35, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the, the, the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, everybody say my sake. My sake. And the gospel will save it. I got one more text. It says in 1 John 1, 8 and 10, it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again, Lord Jesus. For the wonderful time, Lord Jesus, that we share as we worship you in spirit and truth. Thank you again, Lord, as we delve into another application, Lord Jesus, repentance. Teach us, Lord Jesus, that repentance is something that has to do with changing our direction, Lord. Teach us, Lord Jesus, that it is in repentance, Lord, that we as your believers, Lord, need to practice what confession is all about. Father, sometimes our lives, we get so busy, Lord Jesus, living this life. And in our busyness, Lord Jesus, our frailty, our weakness, Lord Jesus, our imperfections, Lord Jesus, begin to show forth. And it, it begins to pile up, Lord, day in and day out. And we forget, Lord Jesus, we forget, Lord Jesus, that we should say, Father, because of the relationship that we have in you, to ask you for forgiveness. Father, you give us an example that the relationships that we have here on earth, one to another, that we do hurt one another, and it is imperative that we learn to forgive one another. This same example is that we should have towards our Heavenly Father, that we too, Lord Jesus, that you are our sovereign God, and because you are sovereign, Lord Jesus, we should acknowledge the relationship we have with you and confess our sins, Lord Jesus. We lean on you, Lord Jesus. We depend on you. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, as you hide me behind your precious cross this morning, Lord Jesus, and help me impart your truth. In your mighty name we pray, and everybody says, Amen. 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 Go ahead and be seated. points this morning. You're saying it's because it's communion service? Nope. I figure this will cover everything that has to do with being repentive. Okay. Shake it off. Everybody say shake it off. Shake it off. That's right. It says right here in verse 32, and he was stating the matter plainly. This is Jesus. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. It's a wonderful statement that each of us should learn. For you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. So why did Jesus rebuke Peter? It's important that we understand this. Obviously, this was a time where the, the multitudes were following Jesus. And of course, Peter, I mean, Jesus was already... Uh, teaching his disciples 
And there had to be a separation here between those that were just bandwagon followers, meaning those that were just interested in the miracles that Jesus was performing, those that were there just to see the awe, uh, the awe and the wonder of what Jesus was doing. Maybe there were those knowing that wherever Jesus was and the multitudes would be, that there would, because they saw the feeding of the multitudes, that they were there for a free meal. There were a lot of individuals that were following Jesus, but Jesus was going to separate those that would be true believers, genuine believers, and those that would just be those people looking from the outside in. And of course, Jesus was here for one primary purpose, and he stated that there. He actually told the crowd, and of course his disciples, countless times he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days, resurrect to glory. His disciples knew this. And so, when we think about Peter, Peter was more, and those of us that have studied Peter, Peter was one of those knee-jerk reaction type of individuals. He usually spoke before he thought about it. And of course, Peter, as soon as he hears Jesus say these words, that something horrific is going to happen to his Messiah, his Savior, his friend, Peter goes and rebukes Jesus. I'm not having this. He pretty much tells Jesus, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? And Jesus turns and he looks at Peter and he has to straighten him out. Because Peter was more interested in the here and now. You're my Messiah. I love you. I care for you. Whatever your, your agenda is, Jesus, is my agenda. Whatever you're all about, I'm all about. Peter's not even thinking about the big picture. He's only thinking about the temporal things. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, when you think about Peter, the word pride generally crops up. And pride is one of those sins that has a tendency to rear its ugly head, not only in the ancient times, but even today. Sometimes we forget why things happen for a purpose. Sometimes it's the bigger picture. Sometimes it's about the greater good. Sometimes it's to glorify your God. And we're more interested in about the temporal, things that will please me, my agenda. And of course, Jesus turns around and he rebukes Peter for that same purpose. Now, I want to reference something because it's important for you to understand. Why did I say shake it off? Everybody say shake it off. Shake it off. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus already instructed his disciples when they were going to go into the villages and the towns. And he told them in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, in the NIV, it says, If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Shake it off. In other words, if this town will not welcome you, if this town will, will not receive you or your words, these words... They have the authority from Jesus to share the good news with these people. And if the village or the town would not welcome these words, Jesus instructed them to shake it off. In other words, get thee behind me. In other words, maybe they weren't deserving of the good news that was going to be imparted to them. Maybe they were people that were just immoral and they would have nothing to do with, with Christ. So in other words, this is where when we talk about evangelism, if certain people will have nothing to do with you, sometimes we take it a little personal. I remember the first time I went to Delta College with a friend and, you know, we decided we were going to go evangelizing, we are going to go share with the supposedly people that were well-learned, we were going to go talk to them about Jesus Christ, and I remember this one guy got in my face. He got in my face, and, and believe me, his words weren't those kind of words, and if you are not grounded in your faith, if you're not one of those individuals that trust God, and if you're one of those individuals that has one foot in the world and one foot in heaven, I wasn't well tested yet. Now, I don't let guys get up in my face and tell me what they think of me, okay? So that old nature started to creep up. 
No, wimp, come on. <laughs> I'm like Peter, you're going to have a sword, I'm going to take my sword out too. <laughs> you know, I'm not that, well, turn the other cheek, that's another gospel. <laughs> and I'll talk about that another time. <laughs> but you know, think about this. I, I, I always wonder when you do Don't evangelism, you know, how are you supposed to do this? God, how do you do this? Well, the thing is, I took it personal. And it was more towards me. And that's not what God is trying to teach here. God is trying to tell us that we, the church, will suffer for his name. So it's not about you. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. And when we do, what we do, if these people will have nothing to do with you, the Bible says to shake it off. Shake it off. You know, at times, it, it's something that we, we think about, we, we struggle with. You know, we take it personal, and, and God wants us to understand there is a bigger picture. If these people will have nothing to do with you, it's not about you. They will have nothing to do with your God. And I have to admit this. I put a little twist to this. It's like this. Well, I know evangelism is not about me, but I almost, maybe I'm too sensitive. I always say to myself, well, why don't you want my Jesus? He's done so much for me. He loves me. He cares for me. He's done so much for me. Why don't you want him? I mean, do you understand that? I could have, that's where I, I lose it. And sometimes it's a very difficult transition. Or this is just me being Pastor Ben. It's tough for me when people won't accept my Jesus. But God is reminding me, and he constantly reminds me, it's not about you, Ben. If they will have nothing from you, then shake the sand from your feet. Shake it off. And God tells us that. Peter was one of those individuals that he just pretty much said, I, I, I don't have the big picture. Maybe he hadn't embraced it. Maybe Jesus taught them exclusively time in and time out that I will suffer in the hands of the scribes and the chief priests. I will have to go through a, a, a torrential rain of getting striped and whipped and suffering. He probably told them that in, in great detail. He probably told them, I will be crucified. The Son of Man will be lifted up. He probably told them all those things. And you know what? I believe they still didn't grasp what he was trying to say. Destroy this body and I will rise again on the third day. Somehow Peter must have grasped that. Because for him to turn around and grab Jesus and said, you can't do this. But the big picture was Jesus Christ came here to save humanity. Of all of our sins. You know, I think about some of the verses that support this, and I don't know why that disappeared. It's, I go from one verse to another. Well, that actually says Luke chapter 2, verse 49. And this is Jesus' response when we think about, and he says in 49, and he said to them, and this was his parents. His parents had lost him, left him at church accidentally, like many of you parents do here. Okay? He says, as his parents came back, he says, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? In other words, the, his parents came back, they were worried sick about where Jesus was, and of course Jesus was in a synagogue, and he, while he was in a synagogue, he was teaching the people. He was here in his primary purpose at a very young, as a very young lad to be about his father's business. And so in the same way, when we think about Peter, Peter was not thinking along those same lines. He wasn't thinking about doing the things about his father's business. And this is something as Christians, we're, we're, not, we're not thinking along those same lines. Sometimes our mindsets are more about what can I gain while I'm here? I don't really have to go to church today because this is more important. I don't need to go to Bible study because I kind of know what Bible study is all about, so it's not really a necessary discipline for me right now. I don't really need to go to prayer because I don't really need prayer. Things are good in my life right now. These are spiritual disciplines that help us. These are 
spiritual disciplines that help us as we go and journey in our Christianity. You know, and it's, it's, this is important for us. You gotta listen real quick. Sometimes as new believers, we, we get into Christianity. We don't quite know what it's all about. We made a profession of faith. And I believe it's genuine. You made a genuine uh, profession of faith in Jesus Christ. But somewhere along the line, you, you miss out on certain things. And I believe this. And God uses this when it comes to relationships. When you meet a good friend, it could be a different type of friend. It could be guys on guys and girls on girls. Or one of these platonic relationships. It could be where you are a guy and you see a wonderful looking sister and there's something about her that engages you. Somehow, someway in this relationship, you want to be where they are. And you want to get to know what makes them tick. So what do you do? You participate or you go where they go. And see, this is the example that Jesus Christ is telling us with the relationship we have with him. You got to know him by making a profession of faith. In other words, you were introduced to him. Now you got to say to yourself, how do I get to know him fully? How do I get and build a relationship with Jesus Christ? And that's where many of us fail. It's not just to make a profession of faith. There are more things included in that. It is to say, how do I get to know Jesus Christ? It is to be involved in a Bible study so I can ask the pertinent questions. Why was Jesus like that? Did Jesus really get angry? Does Jesus laugh? Did Jesus have fun? Ask questions like that. Well, who was Noah? What did the prophets? Why did Paul do what Paul did? You know, I mean, ask all these questions, and these are significant to us that are brand new Christians. And those of us that are mature Christians, we're always finding out as we have Bible studies that there are different truths that we didn't quite grasp. And all of a sudden, bling, a light comes on. There is some type of spiritual affirmation that comes to us, and we go, well, I didn't get that before, but I get it now. That's how we know that the Bible is alive. And it's important for us that as we grow in this, in the same way, sometimes we think, I don't really think prayer is important. It's not really significant in my life. Well, yeah, because maybe life is good. You know, you got three square meals with the dessert in between, <laughs> chips on the side, right? A little bit of salsa, you know, life is good, right? Jobs working good, you're still getting paid. Marriage is great. If you're single, life, you're living large, still living with your mom and dad. Sucking them out to dry. You know? Did I just say that? Okay, I just thought I'd say that. Well, let's just say life is good. I mean, this is a totally different generation. I know that this generation, they can be with their parents till they're 40, then they will. Right? There's something about our generation. I'm, I'm, I'm a post-baby boomer generation. You know, and the reason why I was thinking, am I a baby boomer? And they said, you're the tail end of the baby boomers. That's what they told me. I was the tail end. And the reason why I know that is because the 90s, I understood about the 90s. And they're, they're called the millennial generation. Okay? So I understand that. The thing is, is there's something about, you know, being with our families and having this relationship that we share in our families. And some things, we, we don't always gauge the relationship we have. And God is trying to remind us as we build these relationships, we get to know one another. How much more when you, as a husband or a wife, when you have this, we have this relationship that we got, and that's why I wanted to draw this picture about the relationship we have to one another, and as husband and wife. God tells us the very same thing when it comes to prayer. You know, life is not easy. Life can be going so well for those of you that are thinking life is going so good, the calendar is going to change. In fact, it already has. Leap year. Happy belated birthday. Aren't you a leap year baby? Yes, you are. Okay, and so we think about this. When you think about, you know, the calendar changing, maybe life was good in February where the calendar's changed. 
If you didn't go through a trial in February, be wary. Now everybody's like, did he just curse us? No. Because the Bible tells us that troubles will come. You guys, let me say that again. Troubles will come. And because you are a Christian, it's imperative that you understand this. Now, what helps me? What helps me when troubles come is when I fortify my spiritual life in prayer. If you're not in prayer, if you're not gaining this insight in prayer, I'm putting in a little prop for you, Pastor Brent. If you're not in there, then when these things come, you're caught. And you don't know what just happened? And that's the, that's the difference between somebody who is fortified in prayer, going through life, everything's wonderful, you just sing, the birds are singing, the flowers are blooming, and boom, you get hit. What happened? But when you are fortified in prayer, you understand a spiritual perspective that God is sovereign. God is in control. Your prayers will help you, strengthen you through that difficult time. And when you come together as brothers and sisters in the Lord and uplift one another in prayer, it strengthens the body. It strengthens the soul. It builds a communion between you and God and your dependency on God. This is what God wants. This is part of your communication between you and God, acknowledging that you are imperfect, acknowledging that you are frail and you will make mistakes. And along the line, when life happens, that you are there. And I'm not going to say that we're always ready when life happens, but you are better prepared when you are a person of prayer. Because God steals us. He, he, he girds us up. And that's sometimes, this is where, we're, where we miss. This is where somehow as Christians we, we don't always get it. And being about our Father's business is just that. Doing the things of God that we truly value. And when this is how we get to know. We get to know God through these various spiritual disciplines. Amen? Got one more. Not done yet. Got to reinforce this. This is God's main purpose. He says in 19.10, Luke 19.10, if you're taking notes, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came here to save those who are lost, those that are in need of a Savior. And this is what I'm talking about, the big picture. Peter didn't get this. Sometimes we as Christians, we don't get this. We don't understand that the Great Commission is there for us. This was not a, one of those requests. It wasn't a request to say, you know what, if you, if you want to, you could share your, your Christian life with somebody. That's not what God was trying to say. God commanded us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why it's called good news. It's pretty self-explanatory. We'll move on. This is not... Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. This is the eternal struggle. This is where we struggle. This is where Peter struggled. And this is us as the church. To set your minds on things above. To value the things of God. To, to, to think of my life here on earth as temporary. I'm just a foreigner that is passing through. You know, every time we hear of somebody that is gone, who passes away, we always think of our own mortality. You know, and, and no matter if they're young or old, anytime we hear of somebody who passes, you know, we, we, we feel, you know, a sense of loss, but we also think about, wow, you know, they, they were just once here. And I always think along those same lines. You know, I always think of when we, we lose somebody, and I didn't even know the guy. I knew of the guy because he was my, I was a fan of his, the great Leonard Nimoy. You know, I figured when my son texts me, he goes, oh, yeah, we just lost Spock. 
I'm a Trekkie. You know, I'm a Trekkie. He was one of my favorites. You know, when you think about that, you almost think of mortality, and you think, wow. And I figure, well, I'm still young. But it doesn't matter, because we don't know when your life will be asked of you. Let me say it again. You don't know when your life will be asked of you. And that's why it's important that I cannot think about so much these earthly things. You know, it, being raised, you ever think this way too? My sister Lou and I are going to the Philippines. And that's why I, last time I shared about this was I did not know. I, I can't, I'm so American. And I'm so spoiled when you think about the things of this life. And I, I, I don't understand why my parents came to America. I don't. It's, to this day, I don't know why a lot of people, this, maybe this is my ignorance, why a lot of people that live in various countries want to come to the great U.S. of A. And I said the great because I know this is all I know. But they come here for a better life. I, my, I know my dad drilled in us. I want better for you. And he taught me that because he brought me out there in those fields and said, do you want to do this for the rest of your life? Which I said emphatically, <laughs> I don't even go there. <laughs> but if you, if you think about that, that, there, that was a good teaching. That was a great teaching. It taught me hard work. I'm afraid to roll up my sleeves and jump in there. You know, the thing is, is there was, there was a, a certain thing when I think about these teachings and what God wants us to understand about this life. This life is a difficult life, but it's only temporary. But now that I'm in Christ Jesus, because I want to think about things above, now that I'm in Christ Jesus, I want to value my new life in Christ Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. In other words, I want to value the things of God. We have a fellowship. I want to be part of the fellowship. We have Bible studies. I want to be part of the Bible studies. We have a prayer meeting. I want to be part of the prayer meeting. I want to value the things of God because that is my new life in Christ Jesus. Sometimes holding on to the things of this world is of greater value to me. And again, I'm not trying to put down your, your, all your different endeavors and wanting to do this and wanting to do that on a secular level. But let's get our priorities straight. You know, and in fact, that's what we do. We have a tendency to hold on to the things of this world more than we value the things of God. And that's where we have our, this internal struggle. Set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things. And this is where the Apostle Paul tells us. He tells us the earthly things will pass away. Those of you that drive around in nice Escalades and Lincoln Continentals. Yeah, these nice looking cars. Those of you that drive around in these beautiful looking Audis, <laughs> we're gonna get one one day. It's only temporary though, right? It's allowed. To, so I figured, God, if you're gonna bless me with one of those, I understand it's only temporary. Because I had a 77 Monte Carlo. The Lord give it, the Lord take it away. I think I out of that car. I think that's why he took it away from me. But that's okay, I get it. I do value the things of God. The things of God are very valuable to me. And I, I don't ever want to act irreverent to the things of God. Amen? Let's move on. So I really didn't answer the question. Why Peter did what he did. And there was one part there that I want to capture. In verse 33. I want to capture this one part in verse 33. It says, it says, but turning around, this is Jesus, and seeing his disciples. This is just before he, he rebuked Peter. You know, I, 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 I caught that and I was wondering and asking the Lord, there, there, there is something about that. 
that I felt God was trying to teach us this morning. The author would not have written this down if it wasn't significant. But turning around and seeing his disciples. So what else can we learn from this rebuke? Not just to, not solely and exclusively for Peter, but there was something that Jesus was trying to teach the church. And I think this is important when we think of the significance of seeing his disciples. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that this same suffering that he was going to endure, seeing his disciples, that each one of his disciples would have to endure the same suffering. Peter, he had to get straight. And he did by rebuking Peter. But there's a significance there that tells us, what does that mean to the church? We're no different. We're not exclusive to not having to suffer. And, it, and we are going to have to suffer in Jesus' name. In fact, when we think about third world nations, and we think about individuals, it was an individual that got beheaded for the name of Jesus Christ. And we think, wow, that's, that's kind of gruesome. Here in America, we, we, we don't even think along those lines. We don't think of a martyrdom. We don't, we don't think that that's something we will ever have to endure. But you know what? Time is coming, church. Those that are genuine people of Jesus Christ and those are the fakers. Let me say that again. There's a time that is coming where those of us that will stand for our faith, because, again, how do you know you're going to stand for your faith? If it was a genuine profession of faith. It means you're going to suffer for your faith. And are you going to be able to suffer for your faith? Are you going to be willing as one group? A beautiful brother once said, Kenny Volume once said this, are you willing to die for your faith? A lot of us, let's be honest. If somebody puts a gun to your head and said, denounce Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you got to think about that. Will you die for your faith? You know, some of us may say, well, you know, I kind of said the words, but, Right? And we don't think along those lines in America that this could ever happen. But there is a time that is coming. And Jesus knew this. And this is what it means. When you're about your father's business, your father's business is you being sacrificial. Your father's business means you willing to be tested for your faith. Your father's business means you being obedient to your faith. It's going to cost you. And Jesus knew that as he looked at his disciples and as he teaches his church. It will cost you. And are you willing to go through that? It's something that we as a church never think about. Somebody even says anything about Christian. Do you know when we think about intolerance now? Do you know that the certain agenda that's out there, they have free reign over everything now. But Christianity is now the, the term that if you are a Christian... We're being intolerant of. We are the people that need tolerance, and we are the people that are that, that the world is going after. Because if you even profess Christianity, oh, you're one of those. And there's going to be such a bigotry toward anybody that professes to be a Christian. And that's why I'm telling you: are you with Christ? Are you with Christ? can't talk about abortion. You talk about abortion, somebody brings that up at work, where do we stand? Well, I really don't want to say what I want to believe in or really want to, because I don't want to be controversial or I don't want to be argumentative. Stand up for your beliefs. It's hard. It's hard. You know, I'll be honest with you, and I'm thinking about this. Jesus Christ is with us every step of the way. I wonder what Jesus would think that if you're in your workplace and he's sitting down with you, you're engaged in a great conversation at work, and he's sitting right there. An opportunity comes and says, so what do you think? What are your thoughts on this? It could be something that is horrific, like, do you, do you believe that, that we should kill people that are old? 
you know, the old people, they have no really service to anything, they don't do anything for us, so we should start killing old people. We should kill babies. They don't really have a voice, so, you know, a woman has a right to kill. And here you are, and Jesus is sitting at your side, and what do you say? And people say, you agree with us? And you say, well, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I really don't have a stand on that. And Jesus looks at you and says, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we don't take a personal stand. And we need to repent of that, church. We need to repent of anything that would come against the Spirit of God. That's what we talk about having a repentive app. Applications only make a difference if you put them into practice. And this is what God is trying to tell us. I don't come up with these cliches like shake it off because anytime you think worldly, you have a not a biblical worldview, but you think of a worldly view of things, you need to shake that off. You need to stand up for Jesus Christ, for his righteousness, and things about God. And when you do that, of course you're going to be controversial. But there's nothing wrong with that because I would rather be controversial and be in his will than be out of his will and have to endure the consequences. Because God, you know, think about this. Sometimes we, we think about these applications that I've shared with you, but God wants to know. You know, there's a picture when you think about this cross right here. It's ugly. You ever wonder why? Think about the difference. You see how beautiful that brass cross is right there? I remember when we first bought that, I go, wow, that's going to look good in pictures. You know, you look at the nice brass, you know, stained wood and background, you look at it, but I know my Jesus didn't go on a cross like that. It's true. My Jesus didn't go on a beautiful cross like that. It's just a symbol. But when you think about the cross, there was a penalty that was paid on my behalf, on your behalf. Each one of us, when we think about the, the cost that was paid, it was a great cost. That is a cross right there. That is not anything I would really want to display. But there's a lot of truth to that one. So what do we do? Revelations chapter 2. See, Pastor Van Rao, you really drilled into us. I just want you to see this. This is the Apostle John. He writes this, and I kind of want you to grab hold of this. It says, he's talking to a church, the church is Ephesus, and of course... God's way of bringing affirmation to a church, he tells them all the good things that they do. He tells them, you guys created evangelism, you guys were this. He gave them all kinds of uh, props and, and, you know, told them everything that was wonderful about who they were in Christ Jesus. Then he turns around, and this is the way you should, if you, if you were an individual in a supervisory position, or if you're a mom or dad, this is what you do. Give people affirmation, and then tell them the truth. Okay? This is Jesus. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So what does this mean? Basically, God telling us, we as a church cannot be happy where we are thinking that everything is great. You need a repentive app, God has given you one. God is telling you, maybe things when you were closer to God, because I, I need to explain this, maybe when you were really close to God, things seem great anyway. Do you ever wonder that? When you go through trials, when you're close to God, when you go through trials, trials aren't as big. When you're praising God with every fiber of your being, the, the cares of these world, they don't even bother you. When you face giants of countless sorts, when you are drawing closer and closer to God in your walk with God and you're performing and doing all the spiritual disciplines, those giants, they don't have teeth. There is something about when you come to the knowledge of God's truth and you are close to God, 
that when you are farther removed from God, and when you're farther removed from God, it's almost like you're in a spiritual state of mediocrity. Meaning you don't know, things seem like they're good, but when the trials come and the giants come and the storms come, somehow, someway, where are you, God? And God is telling you, you have forsaken your first love. You know, we get so busy. And you know, busyness is Satan's tool of making the church of God, those of us in Christ Jesus, to removing our power. That's how God gets us. And we, we, we lose sight of this. We get so busy. Part of this club. You know, I got to do this. You know, I, we're in this era now where our kids, they have to do everything. You know, they have to do everything, literally. Uh, they're part of some club. You know, they're involved with, uh, you name it, every social club that's out there. And now that social media is out there, we spend hours and hours on social media. And we get so busy because now TV, TV is so important to us. And so the devil makes us so busy that we don't have time for the things of God. And we wonder when this, these things of life hit us as John is trying to teach us in the church. We fall away from what God is trying to tell us. Get back to the basics. Those of you that are married and you're saying, well, our marriage is in disarray. Get back to the basics. Go back to when you first loved each other. This is what God is trying to teach us. When you are a person who's spiritually lethargic, God is saying, go back. Go back to when you first fell in love with me. And this is what God is trying to tell the church. You know, you say, well, I lost that luster. I've lost that fervor when I come to worship. Go back to where you first came to love God. Amen. You know, it's not hard. It's a basic teaching. Go back to the basic. We hear that all the time. We're going to go back to the basics. And this is all God is trying to employ us to do, to get back to how you first came to know the Lord. You know, it's not, it's not hard. It's easy. You know, we, we, we're right here. We, we're on our baby steps, came to know Jesus Christ. We're so excited. And somehow you figure we should make this normal progression where we get closer and closer to God. But somehow we're here, we're teetering, and we're not really there. And we, we're in a spiritual state of mediocrity. We're not involved in anything. We're just happy. And somehow when things happen in life, we're not prepared for them. And we have fallen from knowing who God is. We get busy. I have to admit, I get so busy doing the things of church. Yeah, I, I had this one long talk with Pastor Phil. And we talked about this. And we used to always justify this. As pastors. Well, I'm into the Bible. I do a devotional. I'm always preparing my sermon. You know what? That's not being with God. Some of us think, if you're a leader, oh, I'm, in, I'm involved, I teach a Bible study, I facilitate a Bible study. You know what? Those are the things of God. But do you have your one-on-one -on -one with God? That's what enables you to deliver as a facilitator. As a pastor, me being in the Word, you may think, well, pastor, he prepares, he has his discipline, he prepares the Word of God. But you know what? God wants his secret time with the pastor. And if you don't have that secret time with the pastor, then you lose the power to deliver. And God is trying to tell us, go back to the basics. Let me tell you something about You don't stay married for 30-something years and not experience difficult times. And I'm going to tell you, when you're married for that many years, we always come up here and invite the married couples that are celebrating, celebrating an anniversary. And we want this as a symbol to those of us that are thinking or contemplating marriage. We want you to know that marriage is the institution God created. And because he created it, it can be successful. 
It's not easy. Let me say that again. It's not easy. But God created it, and if it's Christ-centered, it could be successful. This is what God wants us to understand. You know how it's successful? is when you stray away a little bit, go back to the beginning. Go back to where you first came to love one another. It's simple. Amen? Say, hey, Pastor Ben, are you done yet? I told you that's why I didn't need three points. Okay. First it was shake it off, and this what? And this won't take too long. It says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, anyone who wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake. And think about this. The NIV says, but whoever loses their life for me. For me. Now, this is a misconception. When you read that, sometimes you think, oh, we're going to have to give up a lot. And this is not just for non-believers. This is for some believers. We're under this misconception that Christianity is a faith that requires one to give up what? Life. I remember when I was made a profession of faith, I said, now that I'm a Christian, there was something really great about being a Christian, but it was like, my friends that were Christians were saying, oh, we don't do that anymore. Or you can't do that anymore. And you can't do that, and you can't do that, and you don't do that. Oh, did you know we don't dance? I mean, there was a lot of you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. They were playing the Holy Ghost. Okay? <laughs> I didn't have that, okay? I'm just letting you know. They, a lot of my friends that were Christians were telling me the, the don'ts that you can't do. And, of course, I, I thought that Christianity won't. Well, I guess we can't have fun anymore. And that's a misconception. You know, Jesus didn't say that you could, you, you had to give up your fame and fortune. Because let's look at that. It says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Right? Jesus did not say that you had to give up fame and fortune. He didn't say, did he say that you were going to have to give up drinking and having a, a good party at a, you know, a nice... I've been to some of your parties, and some of you guys have a really good time. Okay? So some people think that when you become a Christian, that, that that now doesn't exist. Jesus didn't say that, you know, you couldn't live life and have a... a you can't have fun anymore. I mean, it's almost like, now that you're a Christian, no fun. I thought I'd let that sink in a while. <laughs> you know, because that's, that's a misconception. One time I was listening to an interview of T.D. Jakes, and T.D. Jakes was kind of speaking, and, and somebody confronted him. And they confronted him about, you know, what Christianity, what are you against? You know, and I, I, I started to think about what he said. But then I thought about it, and I said, you know what, God? I know that in Christianity, there are things that we should not do, and I understand that, that this is a relationship that we have with one another. But God is not here to tell you that we're against this and we're against that, or you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. God has taught me, it's not if you're willing to be, he said this, let me, let me clarify this before I even say this. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must be willing to lose your life. What does he say? For him. And that's clear. If you want to be my disciple, you have to be willing to lose your life for, for him. So in other words, what do we lose? We're not losing anything. In fact, let's be clear of this. We gain what? We gain unconditional love. We gain abundance. We gain refuge. We gain assurance. We gain providence. We gain comfort. We gain peace. We gain eternity. We gain being with Jesus. Amen. And so when you think about along those lines, it's not what we lose. It's what we gain. Yes. And God is trying to teach us along those same lines. Because you know, when I think about Christianity and the do's and don'ts, 
I don't even think along those lines anymore. I think about what God has done in my life, what God has done to sustain my life. I want to put on Christ. And what I put on Christ in Galatians 2.20, which is one of my favorites, Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ where I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, emphasizing that. Because of Jesus Christ being in me, I have the freedom to do. Amen? Amen? I'll move on. Galatians 5, 22, 23. It says, but, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. I want to put on Christ. Because when I put on Christ, they, these are the fruit of the Spirit that God naturally, these what manifest themselves in the new believer. Amen? I see these manifested in each of our lives all the time. There are gestures that I see. Our beloved sister is in the Philippines now, and all of you would agree with me. Sister Lorna Lapistora was a very kind heart. Think about that. These fruit manifest themselves in each of our lives. Amen? I'll move on. One more. Philippians 121. When I put on Christ for me, or to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul wrote all these while he was in prison. How could you write that? You know, I always think about that. How could he write that? But this is what, if, if there's any verse that I want you to grab hold on to, it's this. Our life in Christ, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I want to live my life in Christ. To live my life in Christ is imperative. To live my life in Christ is significant. I want Christ to show out of my life. And because I know he's going to show out, I'm going to be better because of it. I want to share this one illustration with you. How big is Jesus? It says... At the end of a worship service, a little girl came up to her pastor and asked, How big is Jesus? The puzzled pastor pondered and said, I don't know, sweetheart. The Bible doesn't say. He was a carpenter, so I'm sure he had big hands and strong shoulders. Maybe he was six feet tall. I just don't know. Why do you ask that question? The little girl looked down and said, Well, pastor... You said I had to ask Jesus into my heart. I'm just a little girl. If he is as big a savior and he comes into my heart, won't he stick out? <laughs> out of the mouth of babes. Put on Jesus. Jesus should stick out. And shake it off. Because we are not of the world. Our thoughts aren't of the world. We don't want to be part of the world. We want to shake it off. But we put on Christ. The author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus Christ should stick out. Not Pastor Ben. Jesus Christ. Not Sister Dora. Not no, no, none of our sisters. I mean, we think about that. When you as a person... Put on Christ, he should radiate in your life and everything that you do. You know, I, I, I wonder about that. And maybe that should be our prayer as we come to our prayer meetings. That Jesus Christ would be glorified in everything we do. That we will stand up for his righteousness. And, and we will not compromise the things of this world. I mean, because it's sometimes... You know, I find myself, even as a pastor, I don't know if I want to be confrontational with this person today. But Jesus reminds me, it's not about you. It's about me. So I stand up for righteousness. Amen? I repent that. You should download that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you.